we do a mic check, please? Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks Limit Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jennings. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Brazier. My name is John Gordon. I'll be your host. And I'm your host, Katie Burke. Welcome to the Ducks Unlimited Podcast, the only podcast about all things waterfowl. From hunting insights to science-based discussions about ducks, geese, and issues affecting waterfowl and wetlands conservation in North America. The DU Podcast, sponsored by Purina Pro Plan, the official performance dog food of Ducks Unlimited. Purina Pro Plan, always advancing. So today we have a, a really special opportunity, a really special guest joining us here. It's an opportunity for us to continue a conversation about a topic that is of, of great relevance to Ducks Unlimited. We've gotten involved in this over the past eight to 10 months, really, and that's the topic of highly pathogenic avian influenza. We've had a number of opportunities to engage with experts in the infectious disease field, mostly in the wildlife space. And that was largely related to our desire to educate our members, largely, mostly waterfowl hunters, about this issue, what they needed to be doing, the precautions they needed to be taking, and then also educate people on the potential risk to wild waterfowl populations and then uh, its, its risk to poultry, backyard poultry, commercial poultry. The, the virus and the disease that it causes have continued to exist over the past several months. Uh, really since it, 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 it started, since we began to see it here in the U.S. last year. And questions have continued to evolve around risk to human health and, and other, other animals. So we have here an opportunity to welcome in a global expert in this field. Dr. Richard Webby he is a faculty member of the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Dr. Webby is also director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Studies on the Ecology of Influenza in Animals and Birds. I think you've just overtaken the previous person that had the longest title for any introduction we've given in an interview. So congratulations. I, I had nothing to do with the name. <laughs> so it's great to have you here. Also helping us moderate this question and answer is our Chief Conservation Officer, Dr. Karen Waldrop. Karen, welcome. Thank you. Uh, another guest in uh, here with us is Chelsea Bryant, also with St. Jude. So thank Chelsea for, for being here. And I think to start off with, we want to, I guess... Richard will give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. People will will hear you talk and they will they'll hear a bit of a unusual accent. And so you can tell us where you're from, tell us what you do with St. Jude and then any kind of like connection. We were initially surprised to learn that there is a global expert in avian influenza at St. Jude. So a little bit about yourself and what you do at St. Jude. Yeah, so uh, so more sort of my history, I guess. I'm a, as you said, from the accent. I'm clearly from the south, so I'm from Mississippi. Um, <laughs> actually, live in South Haven, but yeah, no. So originally a New Zealander, so I I did my studies down in New Zealand on viruses. And you know, sort of did my PhD and was sort of looking into the big wide world to to come and sort of move into a, a virus that was sort of medically relevant. And so I sort of there was a, a gentleman by the name of Rob Webster who was sort of one of the granddaddies of the influenza world. So he was one of the people that actually discovered that it was the wild waterfowl of the world that where flu really comes from. It's from that host that they sort of spill out to everywhere else. And, and as it turned out, he had a research program at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis. So it's sort of to get to the question of you know, St. Jude, a pediatric children's hospital with a, someone studying avian flu makes no sense. But, you know, when St. Jude started, um, you know, 75 or, or how many how many years ago it was now, um, a lot about what we were learning about how cells turn into cancerous cells actually came from the study of viruses. Um, a lot of the first oncogenes were viral oncogenes. So there was a natural combination of virology and sort of study of cancer. And so they they recruited a lot of um, virologists to St. Jude. Um, you know, and if we look at our patient population, you know, what really is the most risk to our kids is actually infectious diseases. So um, there's a couple of links as to why this program's at St. Jude. And so, yeah, that's I, I came uh, back actually in 1999 to... 
my my position actually at St Jude was funded by a grant Rob Webster had just got to study uh, a virus called H5N1 that was just emerging in Hong Kong. So I sort of came to St Jude in the era where the virus we're talking about now, it's great, 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 great granddaddies um, was just starting to emerge. So, yeah, that's a long-winded way of me saying that's how I came from New Zealand to to Memphis, Tennessee, and that was 23 years ago now and I'm still here. People from here in Memphis, depending on which news station they, they watch, they may see you every now and then on the news talking about sort of the annual human influenza virus. Your lab does a bit of work in that regard too, or at least you're familiar with some of the processes for by which vaccines are identified to match the currently circulating dominant strain for human influenza virus? Yeah, that's right. So, so Saint, uh, the, so the Saint Jude, and it's, that's that long-winded name you said, the Dewacho Clavering Centre for Studies in the Ecology of Influenza and Animals and Birds. Um, so that that particular centre is, is housed at Saint Jude, and and within the the group within Dewacho in Geneva that we're associated with is their Global Influenza program and it's that program that makes the global recommendations or the twice yearly recommendations for what goes in that flu shot and so that group started off with um, a couple of groups sort of what they call collaborating centers so started off with one in London and the US CDC in about the mid about the the mid 1970s they realized they needed a little bit more expertise in that network on more of the animal influenza so the avian influenza say Sort of Rob Webster, as I said, was one of the one of the leaders in the field. So they they came to St Jude and asked if there'd be a collaborating centre within that. So it's it's grown a bit since then. There are now seven of these collaborating centres, but you know, we we travel a couple of times of the year to to Geneva and sit around the table and take part in those discussions about you know what flu viruses are out there circulating now, what are our current vaccine strains, and you know trying to sort of do a little bit of that crystal ball gazing. What's going to be there next flu season, and you know to make sure. Well, to, to try and get the best vaccine antigens in the in the in the vaccine, so yeah, it's sort of it's a interesting part of what we do. Karen, I think I, I think I took one of your questions. No, no, there. I think it's perfectly fine. I mean, that's that's great to get that kind of overall, like on on, a, on an annual basis, and in, in influenza and with how your lab works. How about um, how your lab works in regards to avian? Avian flu. St. Jude's had a, a history of working in this its area for a long time. So, so right now we, uh, you know, a lot of our funding for our research comes from the National Institutes of Health um, in the U.S. and and we're actually funded as a, a center of excellence for influenza research and response. So, within this funding, the the goal is to really provide a research understanding of the pandemic threat posed by some of these flu viruses in the animal populations and, and do as sort of what we can to prepare for them. So, you know, we do, I'm a virologist, so we do a lot of sort of virologic studies on viruses from, you know, both from avian hosts and from swine hosts as well, and characterise, and we come at it from, you know, unlike sort of Dave Stalknick, who I know you've had on here before, comes at it from sort of the, the more wildlife perspective. We come at it from the other side, sort of the human health perspective. So, you know, what viruses are out there in these animal populations, which ones probably cause the most threat to humans, um, and, you know, how do we assess that risk and how do we get better at doing that? And then, you know, how do we sort of develop ways that we can actually reduce the risk and do something about it. That's great. And you mentioned Dr. Dave Stalnick, who's been on the show before, on the podcast before. And so we've actually had um, multiple podcasts where we've talked to experts about avian flu. But for those that might not be familiar, would you mind providing a, a brief introduction as to what is avian flu? Where did it come from? Maybe a little bit about how it's transmitted and then the current situation, how it's different. So I, I think we start, sort of avian flu is actually a terrible name for this particular virus we're dealing with now. So it's this H5N1. So maybe just step back a little bit more to answer your question. So uh, so if you look at influenza, you know, we, I know we're so... we tend to associate with it sort of the sniffle and cold and severe disease we can get during our winter sort of months. But sort of if you look sort of ancestry to all the strains of influenza that are either in, in swine or in humans, they all started their life actually in wild, primarily waterfowl populations. So that is the sort of the, the natural host of influenza. And within that population, there's this whole soup of flu viruses from all sort of different shapes and flavors. I think, yeah, I think to put that into context, if you think of 
COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we think of sort of variants, something people are familiar with variants emerging. If you think of that sort of supersized within the world, um, waterfowl population with flu, that's kind of the situation in there. Um, so that's where they circulate. It's a virus that sporadically pops over, for, of course, from that host into other hosts, whether it's domestic poultry, whether it's swine, and sometimes they find their way to humans. Um, that's sort of the, the natural life cycle of, cycle of these viruses. So where this particular virus is that we're sort of worried about now, um, within the soup, we sort of classify the soup of viruses yeah, we're, we're lab scientists. We're not we're not terribly innovative. So it's H1 through H15. We group them into that. Um, this particular virus we're talking about now is an H5. So it's a particular group of virus. We we first saw this virus, meaning when I say this, meaning the one we're worried about now, and, and in the live poultry markets in Hong Kong back in 1997. I know this is a lie, actually. That was a full, well, that's the first time we saw it. We, they, they subsequently found it for the first time, actually, in southern China, in a, in a goose in southern China. It's sort of a famous virus, a goose, Guangdong, one ninety ninety six. 1996. Um, I remember that one. Um, but, yeah, so that was... And then that virus found its way into the markets in Hong Kong. Um, there were... At that stage, nobody knew that avian viruses could actually directly infect humans. Um, back, back there in 97 in, in, the, in the live poultry markets, there were 18 people that were confirmed infected with that virus. Um, six of those actually died. Sort of that was where really, I think the, the, the field really began to understand there is a threat direct threat from these avian viruses to humans. Um, that virus, they depopulated all of the poultry in Hong Kong. That particular virus went away, but it was still circulating in southern China. It sort of stayed underground for a few years, circulating in that region. In the early 2000s, it started to spread out, and so throughout Southeast Asia, um, through into Vietnam, Thailand, etc. Um, <clears throat> it again, stayed in that region for a number of years. The mid 2000s, 2005, it got into some of, into Qinghai Lake, which is a sort of a, a major um, lake in China where um, sort of a segue to animal, um, birds that migrate through to Europe. So it got into that environment and sort of that, that's when sort of the more global spread happened. What about transmission from... Yes. We can stick to bird to birds. We'll... we'll Okay. Go further on into that later. But. So again, if you're talking about the sort of annual, just sort of just run run of the mill normal avian flu virus, so maybe not this one, but say pick your other favourite H type, be it H four and six, for example. You know that particular virus in waterfowl we think is more of a, a fecal oral route. So the virus tends to be more of a GI infection in in waterfowl, and so that's the route. For Exactly how it spreads from bird to bird is a little unclear, but that's the contaminated source. So maybe the habitat use of waterfowl and yes, you know, feeding yeah. behaviors, being in shallow water and yeah, being in that's boxed, sort of some helps the to... dabbling ducks are more yeah. susceptible to the diving ducks. Yeah, but yeah, and of course this particular, I think it's it's a little less clear right now what this H five N one. I think there's probably a little bit more respiratory spread with this particular virus. One of the things that you bring to this conversation, Richard, is a more global perspective. As we've talked about, we've had a number of guests that have a more North American focus. But we've been trying to schedule this conversation for probably th three months. The first time, the first set of dates, we tried to identify you were in Geneva. Second set of dates, we identified you were in Brazil. So I'm curious of your perspective on sort of the global view of this, the relative risk and the way it's being viewed in different countries, maybe in comparison to, to North America. I'd kind of just give us, give us a sense of the tone of the conversation from a global perspective. Yeah, so I think the tone really has changed, at least if we're talking the Americas, Europe and Africa, with this particular form of this H5 virus. So something happened in probably mid-2001 and you know, where this particular virus that was circulating did something that made it, I think, a little bit more fit for wild birds. And so, you know, Europe, Europe up to that point had, you know, this wasn't a virus they hadn't had, right? So, but it would be more seasonal. So, as the birds migrated through, they would get spillover into their poultry populations. So, it was more of a seasonal 
thing for them. In terms of Africa, it's probably, with the exception of Egypt, where it was um, endemic in their poultry, probably something similar. But sort of post-mid-2001, they're now, I think, facing the fact that they're in an endemic situation. So, yes, for them, they're absolutely, this is a major issue for, for that well, both industry but human health as well. Um, and, of course, for the Americas, we just haven't had it before at all. So, you know, for us, it's – and South America, of course, is, is now dealing with it and I don't think they really have much of a feel for how widespread it is down there. Um, and, I, you know, my gut feeling is Africa is also the same. This virus is now probably set up shop in a number of places in Africa and and so it's very much of a different different feel now than we were two years ago. You described it as being endemic. What do you what exactly do you mean by that in in terms of how we can expect this virus to persist going forward? What does that mean in the virological sense? Yeah, so I guess what because you know, it's endemic and probably the wild the migratory birds within some of these places anyway, but prior to that. But I think even within some resident bird population, so it's not, so when the migratory birds sort of move away, you know, historically the virus is gone, but I, th- yeah, I think it's more, that's actually stayed over a couple of those seasons now in Europe. So again, resident populations of birds, whatever they be, sort of maintaining it locally as well. So what does that mean longer term? You know, I think it's, it's, for at least for Europe and Africa, it's more of a year-round concern now. Um, so there'll be local spread. Probably as migratory birds move back and forwards, they may bring slight variations of it with them, so seed new outbreaks. Um, and for, of course, us, it's it's a night and day difference. Thinking back to 2014-2015 um, where we first saw this virus in that part of the world. You now it came in via the, the, the left coast and... But for whatever reason, we don't even know, right? Didn't make it through the summer months. Um, but now, you know, I think even this virus died out in the in the migratory birds. For whatever reason, I still think it would still be here. So maintained in other populations of birds. You think this virus will persist in wild waterfowl populations for the foreseeable future? I, this subtype, this yeah, and then this subtype. I mean, mate, it'll it could change, right? So that's one thing about flu. It's you know it does continually change. So it may change form, but I find it hard to imagine this virus going away this time. And I, I guess we'll we'll transition here to talk about what we saw in waterfowl. Uh, last year, beginning in October, November, our phones started blowing up from a lot of our members, waterfowl hunters that were seeing snow geese, Ross's geese die in alarming numbers, sick, dying in alarming numbers. But then around mid-December, we began to, our state partners, federal partners, our waterfowl hunting members started to notice a pretty significant decline in symptomatic birds they were observing in the field, and it seemed to be pretty pretty prevalent, uh, pretty prevalent observation. How do you describe what was going on there? Is that uh, a lot of people had had surmised that that was the op- that was the time frame over which the more susceptible birds fell ill and died, and then there was some immunity that was developing. What do we think, or what do we know now, with a few months behind us, was happening, and why we saw that de- decrease in December? Yeah, so I think it's almost. It's certainly due to a build-up of immunity in those populations. And I think there's some solid evidence coming from people like Dave Storkneck who are looking in these populations that there is a now, a, at least in some of them, a good level of immunity to these viruses. But we're going to think that's, you know, in any infectious disease, you know, whether it be COVID, whether it be influenza, and in any population, whether it be humans or a bird or, you know, again, pick your animal, there's always going to be a spectrum of severity of disease, um, through those that you know die because of it, um, but there's always going to be survivors. Um, whether they just don't get the same dose of virus, you know, they have something about their genetics, they're just not as susceptible. You know, as, as you say, I think the the most susceptible birds of you know were were killed, but there were many that survived, were infected, developed immunity to that virus, um, and survived. And so, you know, I think that's probably the transition point that we saw from a, a you know lots of die-off to now, um, not as much. And you know, I think we may come to those questions later on, but that I think it also brings up, you know, uh, lots of questions about, you know, what does that do to the virus itself? You know, 
does that mean it's going to go away? No, I don't think so. You know, does that mean it's going to be harder to find the virus? Maybe. Um, so lots of questions surrounding that. But, yeah, to direct answer that question, I think what happened, population immunity just built up um, and therefore we didn't see the mass die-offs. So, this, Karen, this is probably a good place for mm -hmm. us to ask about your expectations for what we may see this fall when waterfowl populations begin to migrate south again. I think you'll be the first person that we will have the opportunity to ask that question of among the experts that we plan to talk with. So last year when the virus was circulating, there was, in my, my understanding, pretty much there was very little immunity or ex prior exposure, whether we're talking about adult birds or juvenile birds. Now we're at a point where we have a lot of adult birds that would have been exposed to it last year. So there's a question in, question in there about what do we know about duration of any of the immunity that they would have acquired, how long that would persist. But then also, given your expectation of this being endemic now, do you think we will see similar levels of mortality and illness among young birds? If you had to handicap it, what's your expectation? Yeah, I think it's a... It's a hard one to answer because if, if you think about, again, a population, mortality in a population, it sort of is a mix of sort of the set, susceptible birds in that population. But you also have to have enough density of birds that are susceptible for it to spread as well. So, yeah, so clearly if a if, you know, hatchling animal bird is infected, it's you know, there's a good chance it may die. But you know, whether there's going to be enough of that virus in the population, you know, to pass from that to, you know, uh, immune adults through a population, I think is a little bit unsure. Um, so, yeah, whether it be the mass die-offs in that population or just sort of scattered deaths, I, I, I don't have a good feel for. Um, yeah, I think the virus will probably move down with those birds in some form or another. It's quite interesting and, you know, we've been doing, so we, Rob Webster, has been doing studies in a couple of, populations of birds in North America for close to 50 years now. One is actually in Alberta, so in sort of mallards and pintails as they sort of marshalling to fly south. We team up with the Canadian wildlife folks there and they, as they're banding birds, they'll swab them and send them to us. And actually right now we have teams in the Delaware Bay region um, in New Jersey, so sampling the sort of fecal material from the shorebirds that are stopping off to from their migration to feed on horseshoe crabs, eggs. Um, so again, a long-winded way of getting to your answer. But if we look at those populations and we look for vir viruses all the time, you know, we, we almost always see viruses in those populations. Um, some years we'll see lots of virus, some years not so much, at least in particularly in the Delaware Bay site. For many years it's sort of cycled, so from high prevalence to low prevalence to high prevalence to low prevalence. Since Sandy, it's been a little bit messed up, Hurricane Sandy. Um, but also we see different viruses every year, so it's not like we see the same viruses every year. Sometimes we see some, sometimes we see another. And so I, I get to the point, if we don't we don't really understand how viruses are maintained in these populations, probably enough to make the predictions that everybody wants. What is going to happen to this? Is it going to come every year? Is it going to come every other year? You know, what, how long is this immunity? So do we get a period where immunity is high, so virus prevalence will stay low, but then it wanes over When you have a course, naive population More naive come and in. bang, yep. we get another burst. So these are questions we yeah, we don't have answers for, but I, I again, my gut feeling is this one is different than most of the other viruses that we have in this population. So even patterns we've seen with other low path flu, we can't necessarily translate to this one. But I think it'll it'll stay. I think we'll we'll see it come down with birds when they when they come back down. We'll see spill over to domestic poultry and sort of, but maybe on a smaller scale than certainly we've seen in the past couple of years. You said, you know, as far as what you're starting to see with this, another thing we're starting to see a lot more is infection in, in mammals. Um, you're hearing a lot more reports with sea lions, otters, mink, fox, uh, bears, you name it. Um, and, you know, the national media is reporting on this a lot more, so the general public is is hearing a lot more about it. I guess the question is, can you can you provide an update on our understanding in this regard as far as, you know, this is bird flu, right? And so... Why are we starting to see some of this as far as in mammals and why are they contracting the virus? We know this is a, this is a virus that is really supremely 
sort of fit for birds, um, you know, particularly waterfowl bird, I think. Um, it's poorly infectious for mammal hosts. But if you look at the mammal hosts that are getting infected with perhaps, let's put aside the, the sea mammals for now, because it's a little unclear about those, but certainly the, the foxes, the bears, the mountain lions, you know, we, we think they're getting infected from sort of chomping on a on a, a dead or sick bird. So they're getting a huge amount of virus at one time. And that's probably why they're getting infected. Um, little evidence, uh, at least when there's wild population that is, and again, sea mammals aside, that there's any evidence that it's gone mammal to mammal. So these are one-off, we think of one-off events where an animal has really had a huge amount of virus from sort of feeding on a, a sick or dead carcass. And that's how they Similar to what we're seeing with hawks and birds of prey, eagles, and yes, everything else yeah, exactly. too. Exactly. But, yeah. but the, as far as it being different in mammals than, than birds, I mean, so it as far as the transmission and the ability to transmit, do you see a lot of difference there? Yeah, well, I think from the from the virus perspective, um, we get a little bit worried from when we see mammal infection because if this virus is going to adapt to humans, it's much more likely that that adaptation is going to happen in an infection of a mammal. So while these viruses are circulating in birds, there's almost a selection against them being more mammalian-like. So that's why we get a little excited and probably why the, the media sort of catches on to that excitement when we see mammal infections is that's the host. But right now there's no evidence, no, uh, not a lot of evidence as to that uh, these mamma mammalian infections have sort of caused much change in the virus. Um, so clearly it's a virus, still avian virus, transmits well between avian species mm -hmm. um, and can transmit from avian to mammal in rare circumstances. But, no but why would it no if it's mammal. working so well in birds, That's why right. would it adapt yep. to, to transmit exactly. to humans? And, and, and no mammal to mammal. And so you've kind of talked, you don't think it's a lot of mink, like um, animal to animal, or mammal to mammal. So that whole thing was in uh, the mink to mink in the Spanish farm. Yeah, so no. that's, uh, if we look, there's a, yeah, I guess. And I'm not sure how commonly known that is as far as that situation on that farm, as far as the, the mink to mink transmission thought. Yeah, so the, the mink to mink and the potential sea lions, some of the sea lions in, in Peru are situations where it's more likely there was mammal to mammal spread. I think the mink farm, there's still a little bit unclear. So apparently some of the way they, they feed the mink is sort of just mass sort of throwing out of, of meat into these cages. So there's still some possibility they were infected for a sort of common feed source, mm -hmm. but uh, I think probably a little bit of mammal-to-mammal -mammal transmission. We've actually just received that virus um, in our lab um, last week, so we're going to do a little bit of work to see if, if it actually has any changes that might yeah. suggest so transmission. A lot of our, our, um, our employees, but as well as also our members, they all have a lot of dogs, right? We waterfowl hunt and a lot of them have retrievers and, and other dogs and other pets too. So just, uh, you know, there's been a lot of interest or concern um, among our members and as far as the susceptibility and transmission to domestic dogs. And didn't know if you could share a lot. Of, we know we had a, we did have a, a dog. Uh, there was one mortality from a, of a dog being infected. So didn't know if you could share a little bit more on that. And yeah, dogs. so the... You know, we know dogs can be hosts of flu and they have, you know, actually had some um, some lineages of flu that have been maintained within them, even here in the US and some of the greyhound populations. Um, but the, I think dogs right now, you've got to think of them a little bit like these others. Think of them like a fox or a, a skunk or a badger that's going to, if they feed on something and get a huge dose of virus, they can actually be infected with it. So the risk is still very low. I think they have to get a, a large amount of virus. From a duck hunter's perspective, you know, probably just retrieving a duck, the chances are probably pretty low. But if it was a, you know, a dog in the backyard who came across a, a, maybe a dead carcass and was a little less trained and started tearing into it. You know, so maybe then that's where the risk goes up. Um, so, yeah, low risk. It's not zero. Um, but again, from a human health perspective, luckily we haven't seen that mammal-to-mammal -mammal spread. So, you know, there, there is a chance the dog probably has a higher risk than the owner. Um, the owner's chance of catching it off their dog, again, is pretty slim. It's, again, another unsatisfactory answer. No, it's a, no, no, it's, no, a, it's a low risk, but under the right conditions, that we, right. we know it can happen, yeah. So take, pay attention to what you're doing, right? Absolutely, yeah, right. so I think, yeah, it's any sort of respiratory symptoms and, and dog, yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, just be a little bit more careful around them as well as sort of getting to 
the, in getting to a vet, but let the vet know in advance what let them come what in contact. Be, yeah, with. what might be happening, so at least they're a little prepared as well. And one of the primary reasons why we wanted to pick your brain on this is because I mentioned this a little bit earlier. If you go online and search for avian flu, human health risk, or something along along that line, now you'll find articles where it talks about this being the potential next global pandemic, right? And so there's a lot of that that sort of information out there right now. You can also find in those articles an apparent, a very high apparent case mortality rate in humans for this for this virus as well as I think other H5 viruses over the, the, the life of their existence. That case fatality rate, if I'm remembering it correctly, is somewhere around 50% is what's reported. But you'd probably be quick to clarify that that's not a we, we don't have a lot of confidence in that number. So can you, if people were to have read any of those articles or heard about a high case fatality rate uh, associated with this, provide some, I guess, comfort to us on why we shouldn't take that, that percentage to heart. Yeah, right. Well, so one, we shouldn't take it to heart, but we should be at least a little bit concerned about it. Um, but you know, in terms of all influenza, that, that, is, that is high. But we've got to think about this particular virus. So um, as I said before, when... Any infectious disease, when anyone gets infected, there's going to be a sort of a sort of the gauntlet, uh, gauntlet of disease severity. Um, with H5s, um, again, the way they're typically picked up is people come into the hospital with severe disease, so they're yeah, you know, the flu is one of the differential diagnoses. They'll test them for flu. They'll see it's flu, but it won't type as one of the seasonal strains, and so then it'll go and get type for H5. We've got to think. So the only people that are probably getting diagnosed with H5, or most of them now, are those that are really, really sick. So people that have more mild disease, um, they go to a normal doctor's office, then they're not getting picked up. So yeah, when we talk about a case fatality rate. You know, that's why they use that case fatality because it's a case. In terms of how many true infections, there have been probably a lot more. We've done some studies with collaborators in Egypt where we've actually gone into um, some of their poultry raising areas and, and sort of bled people and looked for exposure. And we can see, you know, there's, the percentage is up to sort of two, three, four, I mean, five percent of people can have evidence that they've been exposed to this virus, um, meaning likely infected. So, yeah, the actual true number of cases is probably a lot higher than it is now. Stay tuned to the Ducks Unlimited podcast, sponsored by Purina Pro Plan, after these messages. Guidance from the CDC and other other um, institutions out there now will advise that the risk to humans from this virus is still very low. Part of that, I think, is related to the fact that humans are not likely, the, the risk of humans coming into contact with the virus uh, through contact with a bird is, for most people, pretty low. We were talking at lunch about this. The reason this question is a really is of interest to us and our members is that our our waterfowl hunting members and a lot of other people that may interact with waterfowl, but especially hunters, are probably a group that are at higher risk of exposure to infected birds, dead birds, water that would have the virus in it. And and so that's that we're sort of a special case of, of a, a subset of the human population. Are there certain ways that we could get exposed to that would that would be more concerning, that would le- be more likely to lead to severe virus? What are the areas we need to be most concerned about? Yeah, so you know, there's other great questions. So, you know, this, this particular virus, uh, the fact there's been low number, rel- well, relatively low number of human cases, yeah, there is some exposure. It's also a virologic property. Again, we talked before, this is still very much a bird virus. It has to make some changes to be a human virus. Um, but you're dead right, people. It's, it's a bit of a numbers game. So it's a very, very rare event. But the more chances you have of being exposed, that puts you at greater risk. So, yeah, you're, sort of your, um, your audience is, is potentially at a higher risk. If we look at that, so what are the most risky events? And you know, one thing we know about this virus is that 
um, it binds to receptors, what we call a receptor. So that's this is on the cells of avian, um, on the avian cells within sort of a bird, which are primarily in the gastrointestinal tract, a little bit in the respiratory tract. Um, the viruses, the receptors that we have in our upper respiratory tract are a bit different. So that's why the virus doesn't bind so well to our nose. We do have some of those same receptors deeper into our lungs. So the thought is that any activity that produces more of an aerosol sort of um, is more a dangerous activity than perhaps, you know, just collecting a duck for, or a, from a, you know, from a, a retrieved duck or something like that. So I think anything that you could do that would be sort of, allowing that virus to sort of pillow and sort of into the air, whether plucking, um, those are the types of things that are more at risk. And so the nice studies have been done, you know, both here in Southeast poultry and in confined settings or in some of the poultry markets in Asia as well, looking at where the most risk is. And it tends to be in those situations is where they're doing sort of deep plucking. So these deep plucking machines that spin the bird around and, and can, can create aerosols. So again, thinking about risk to hunters, um, or people cleaning ducks, anything you do that, again, would sort of allow the virus to sort of be aerosolized, that's that's the most risk. So that's, that's where you should take the most care, for sure. I believe Dave, uh, Dr. Dave Stalnick echoed the same sentiment that he was advising that individuals that are plucking their birds, certainly through those mechanical pluckers, make sure you're in a well-ventilated space. It wouldn't be out of the question. He would advise if you are in, in, in that situation consider wearing a mask in that absolutely. particular situation. Would You would agree? Yeah, no, absolutely. So there's some really, I don't know how much time, I've already wasted a lot of time, but some really nice studies where at Southeast Poultry, we were talking about like where they sort of mimic these environments and they, they sort of mimic the live poultry market with defeathering machines and they put ferrets at different places around this. So ferrets are the host that we use to sort of mimic human infection. And they found they sort of mimic from purchasing a bird to killing him. And it was, it was when that defeathering machine mm. was in action, that's when the ferrets around it became infected. And, and the same, they've had air sampling things they've taken into some of these markets. And, and it's definitely the defeathering is where a lot of the virus gets spilled into the air. So for this virus maybe to become highly, you know, uh, infectious for humans, you, you mentioned just a few minutes ago that the, the virus would have to make some changes, right? And so we talk about viruses mutating and things like that, but what, do, what does that really mean? And what do we currently know about the risk of it, of it mutating to where it would become highly infectious for humans? And you talked a little bit about that when we talked about the mammal-to-mammal transmission in, in birds, but if you could expand on that. Yeah, so the flu is sort of, uh, again, one of these viruses that continually mutates. So it keeps on throwing out mutations every time it replicates. Um, and we know from studies that were done in the lab that for this virus, the H5, and probably others too, to change from being a, a bird virus to a human virus, there uh, has to make almost what we say three categories of changes. And when I mean change, I mean mutations in the various proteins that it makes. One of them we've already talked a little bit about is that it has to change the ability to bind from that receptor on the avian cell to the receptor in the upper respiratory tract of human cells. That probably takes a two or three changes in one protein to do that, in the, H, the H5 protein itself. We haven't seen much evidence that this virus has much capacity to easily make those changes. There's another one in the replication machinery of the virus that when it gets into a cell that makes more copies of itself. Um, we know there's a mutation or a series of mutations that if a virus gets it, it replicates a bit better in mammal cells. Um, we've seen that mutation quite a number of times when these mammals have been infected. So that mutation is not in birds, but in the, you know, again, in the foxes, the raccoons, the bears, we do see those changes quite a bit. So that's a change as virus can make pretty easy. And the other one, again, is a little bit more to do with sort of stability of this virus and sort of getting to the nitty gritty of pHs within different cells. I don't know if we have to get into it, but it kind of has to make those changes as well. We don't know as much about those. Um, so three categories of changes. One, we know this virus can do easily. One, we know it's hard. The other, we're a little uncertain about. But I think that, then that, but that's sort of the, coming back to the point is why we get really worried about mammal species. While this virus is replicating in birds, it's, it's still it's making mutations and stuff, but there is no pressure or selection in those birds for that virus to make the change. There's almost 
a pressure against it changing because if, if these viruses make those mutations that make it more mammalian-like, it makes it less avian-like. And if you're a virus that wants to replicate and spread in avians, you don't want to make those changes. So It's a good host. Yeah, yeah it's a good time. host. So yeah. um, but again, it's why we worry when it gets into a mammalian host because that's the host that's going to put a little bit more pressure on that virus to actually make those changes. I hope that made sense. This is probably a good time to check in to see if there are questions from from uh, anybody online, Chris, or anybody here in the, in the audience. We have a few others, and I have Bobby here. Hey, my question is, um, so it spreads during the defeathering. Is that because of dander or bloodborne or? Yeah, so probably, yeah, so probably a little bit of a, so these highly pathogenic, which this H5 is, um, they go systemic. Yeah, so that it's probably, there's a bit of viremia, there's, you know, you can get some, um, in different parts of the, the, so it's, yeah, it's from, probably from blood, but it's probably, you know, a little bit of dander as well, but even just, uh, you know, the, the virus itself from whatever secretions is just getting sort of, you know, and, you know, people have found, you know, I think the risk is low, but, you know, even, even from meat, you, know, you can, juices from meat, you can find virus sometimes. So it does get in, you know, throughout these birds. And so it's just, it's probably a little, you know, those environments are typically not the cleanest. So, you know, you say there's a lot of different bits and insides that are also in that mix. So this is just kind of building off of what they were just talking about, but would avian researchers that work with things like airboats and stuff that push off a whole lot of aerosolized water, should they be more careful in the coming field seasons but not standing behind the airboat? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Again, it's any anything that increases risk right. is, increases risk. Again, it comes back to that thing, that was, yeah, would, uh, would that contaminated water be in, have enough sort of infectious dose to infect you, I, I would maybe not. You know, had it just gone over a, where, where a huge amount of birds were, had just been, where there's a, little, you know, a lot of infection going on, I guess it's possible. But, again, I think, I think the, the dose on that is probably not going to be high enough. Right. Question uh, from yeah, This question's online from William Bond. The name of this strain that's been used is highly pathogenic avian flu. Is there a significant pressure on strains like this to become less pathogenic over time as that behavior is more likely for an infection to last longer and infect more birds, potentially allowing this virus to still circulate but not be much of concern due to lower mortality? Yeah, so great, great question. Um, so, William, I think the answer... So, highly pathogenic in the flu world, um, and again, I apologize if... You guys have heard this a thousand times before, but so most we talked about before in these wild bird populations, the H1 through H16 subtypes of flu, um, those are in this low pathogenic form. Um, subtypes from the H5 or H7, when they get, that doesn't happen, we don't think it happens in waterfowl, it happens when they get into terrestrial poultry species, so into chickens, turkeys, maybe quail. Um, some of those H5 and H7 types of virus, um, at a, through a molecular mechanism we know, they gain basically extra amino acids in one part of the protein. And that's, uh, that actually allows them to go systemic. We talked about systemic spread before. It's that transition, this gain of extra amino acids that um, allows them to actually spread systemically. And that's what causes this transition from, you know, a typical low low pathogenic form to a high pathogenic form. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty confident in saying we've seen this happen a number of times. It doesn't happen often, um, but, you know, we've seen it happen. You know, we've seen H7 outbreaks even in Tennessee, for example, over the last, you know, decade or so. Um, I don't think we've seen it where these viruses lose those amino acids. So they don't, if you're speaking of sort of a virologic property, I don't I don't think we've seen it where it goes from high pathogenic to low pathogenic. But I think what's more likely to cause that virus to go a little bit less um, is perhaps that host immunity. Um, you know, this, this particular virus, the H5, the highly pathogenic H5, uh, again, these descend all from that goose virus, well, probably even before that, but we first saw it in goose virus in 1996. And you know, we've seen waves of different forms of this virus. Sometimes they're a little more nasty than others, but 
you know, this virus now is the same of that. It's been circulating for, you know, 20, 25 years and hasn't really lost a lot of its intrinsic pathogenicity. So, you know, the hope that, you know, this this thing will will do go from killing everything to killing nothing, I, I don't think is likely now. Do you know if there's like any potential role or prospects for vaccine, either in poultry or humans, anything like that? Do you see? Yeah, so there's actually, in terms of, well, both sides of it, you know, um, if you talk about the human, they have actually done clinical trials with H5 vaccine. So that back in Hong Kong in 97 where you know, 18 infected, 16, that actually triggered a number of tr- clinical trials with H5 vaccines. Um, we have some, a, a little bit of vaccine that the US government has even prepared and done some clinical trials with that we've actually looked at the blood from some of these people um, in the lab at St. Jude, and it does actually recognise these viruses pretty well. So from a human health perspective, yeah, we do know how to make vaccines against it. There isn't huge amounts of them, but that could be ramped up pretty quickly. Um, from a poultry perspective, you know, many parts of the world have been vaccinated against H5. Think China, think Egypt, think Mexico, or Mexico for not this virus, but other viruses. Um, Bangladesh and other countries have been vaccinated against this as well. Uh, from a US perspective, I think it comes down to, it comes really boils down to, at least for poultry trade, right, there's dollars. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of importing countries will use an inability to prove that you're free of disease, which vaccination makes that harder. Um, I, but, yeah, having said that, I, I think we're about to, from what I understand, about to vaccinate some condors in in California here in the very, very near future. So some populations we're going to see vaccination um, on a broader scale. Um, in poultry, I think it's a little more questionable and we just don't have a good way to vaccinate wild birds, unfortunately. I have a couple of final questions. We have a lot of staff that interface with waterfowl hunters. The group that is going to be, that's going to have um, certainly a keen interest in this, going to be exposed to the situations where they're going to encounter this more often. If our staff are asked by waterfowl hunters, hey, I hear about this avian influenza virus. Do we expect it to be around again this year? I think we know what the answer to that's going to be. Uh, but how concerned do I need to be about it? What advice would you give to our members to for a brief statement, well-informed statement about what they need to be communicating to waterfowl hunters? Yeah, so I think that statement will be that the, the risk, this is still a low-risk virus for human health, but it's, it is not zero. So I think if the, the more that those hunters can be aware that this virus is there, aware of the fact that, you know, there is a risk even if low. So, you know, anything they can do to, and this is not, I clearly haven't given you a short answer for your people to give, but anything they can do to reduce that risk is a great idea. Uh, and so just, you know, in their mind, think about, you know, that duck is potentially infected. You know, so what can I do, whether it be gloves, just being more careful when you're defeathering, et cetera. Anything you can do to reduce the risk is good. So just, you know, think a little bit more about that, sort of that bird as being a source of infection for you. And the same, you know, the, the same sort of COVID-like thing, you know, washing your hands and, you know, and, and stopping as much as you can any sort of inhalation. Same type of guidance regarding their their dogs, Keep an eye on them if they yep. appear ill. Be aware of their potential exposure to sick birds. Don't be afraid to contact your vet if you think something is maybe That's right. Miss. But yeah, so I, I think if, as, as we did before, I think definitely if if you suspect it could be, then you know give give the vet a little bit of a heads up because they may not want that bird sort of bowling into their front office, so they they may look at it some other way. Yeah. We have another question from Did the I say bird audience. or dog? If I said dog, bird, dog. Oh, I did. Yeah, I know, I? We know what you meant. <laughs> Where are the condors that might be vaccinated? Are zoos vaccinated? So some of the things, yeah, so the condors, I believe, are <clears throat> some of the populations are the California condors. Um, so I was on a call with some folks yesterday who mentioned, I think they're about to initiate that. And also, I think this will now also spread to some of the more valuable the yeah, zoo populations as well. So, yeah, we do have avian vaccines that work against this virus, actually quite a number of different platforms. So, yeah, I think we'll see more, some of these more valuable populations, zoo birds will start to be vaccinated. But because they're endangered condor, yeah. California condors, one, they're going to try to... Yeah, and that's exactly, I think there's, there's, not very there's many a lot of... of con- Again, I don't... I'm by it's no a, means a condor expert. You guys probably more big, than me. But yeah. Big concern. Yeah. We have another question. A person could clearly tell when a Canada goose was infected by behavior in cloudy eyes. 
Some folks were still eating these birds, just making sure they were well cooked. Is this an acceptable practice? Uh, so I guess it comes back to uh, again, it's a low it's a low chance of being infected, but anything you do to increase that chance increases the, the chances, right? So um, is it advisable to eat something you th think is there's a good chance to infect with H5? No, not really. Um, <laughs> but, you know, at the same time, you know, it's we haven't seen people um, infected via that route, but... Yes, I, I, I no, it, it, it's not a, it's not good practice. So, for example, you know, we work with these viruses in the lab. We sort of do the full sort of spacesuit with a respirator on um, if we're dealing with infected animals with this particular virus. So, that's I, I don't suggest you all go and do that. But um, yeah, eating them if you can get away with it's probably not a good idea. Any sick or dying that's wildlife right. well, that we consume certainly, is yeah. probably not a. I think the same thing. Good you know, going back to sort of the mammal. Again, we've got to even think at psyche a little bit if this is going to be endemic. If you know there is a you know a, some of these you know birds of prey or mammals that are acting a little bit weird, we should just you know we should be a little bit careful around them and, and think that potentially is a source of infection for me. Before we before we go there, any any final questions from Karen? No, I don't think so. I'm thinking good. Thank you. Okay, we have one final question from the from the audience. Um, Dr. Mike has mentioned that you are part of the barbecue circuit. So uh. would you enlighten us on your barbecue prowess? I can't. There was a secret. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm in the circuit too, so I understand. Yeah, no. So we, we did compete in the yeah, the Memphis May barbecue. Actually, did pretty well this year, but okay. that's a rarity. Typically, we're closer to the bottom than we are than we out of the top. Yeah. <laughs> How did you get, how'd you get on? Uh, we finished 18th out of 79. But we won turkey and we won vinegar sauce. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very good. And we were top 10 in tomato sauce. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I need your secrets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if there are no other questions, I'll just say thank you, oh, you're Dr. Very, very Webby. Welcome. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for the for joining us earlier for lunch. It was a great conversation. And you know, I'm happy if people have questions they think of later, if they could, you know, my email's richard.webby at stjude.org, or if they want to funnel them through, happy to answer follow-ups. Karen, thank you again. Mm -hmm. Of course, thank you. Being part of this. A special thanks to our guest on today's episode, Dr. Richard Webby, faculty member at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital here in Memphis. We appreciate all the insight he brought to this topic. Also thank my uh, co-host here, Dr. Karen Waldrop, Ducks Unlimited's Chief Conservation Officer. We appreciate her time as well. As always, we thank our producer, Chris Isaac, for the great job he does getting these episodes out to you. To you, the listener, we thank you for your time. We thank you for supporting Ducks Unlimited, and we thank you for supporting wetlands and waterfowl conservation. Thank you for listening to the DU Podcast, sponsored by Purina Pro Plan, the official performance dog food of Ducks Unlimited. Purina Pro Plan, always advancing. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit ducks.org slash DU Podcast. Opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily reflect those of Ducks Unlimited. Until next time, stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned.